Well, good. Well, thank you very much for your attendance. And uh, hopefully, I can refocus a little bit on all of the good work that's been done by all the research and the developments of new technologies and the exciting work that's happening even now that we're learning here at this conference. And I'd like to take us in a little bit of a different direction and say, how can we take all of these new discoveries, this new research, and make it really practical in the application side and make it acceptable to all those uh, regulations around the world, right? Because obviously we can develop the best technology out there, but we have to do it in a way that's safe, in a way that allows the technology to be accepted and installed around the world. So what I'd like to take you through today is basically an overview of those standards for photovoltaics, talk a little bit about some specific polymeric issues that we've come across, and talk specifically as an example of how this all comes together by looking at the relative thermal index and talk about long-term thermal aging, how we can assess that on an end product basis as well as on an individual material and how that all impacts the acceptance out in the field. As we all know, the AHJs or authorities having jurisdiction often control whether or not a particular module can be installed. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the data analysis. In our background here in standards, and this isn't just UL, but this is really the development of standards goes way back as, as plastics started to become developed, as polymers were developed. And as you can see, our first standards were back in about 1941 when we started to talk about um, uh, different types of evaluations to show that materials would maintain their properties. And they kept advancing as the polymer development advanced up and through and including today. And so what we did really was starting back in 1938 when they started to use polymers as insulating materials, that we be it became apparent that their characteristics became very, very important to safety. And I'm primarily going to discuss safety today, although this also has a lot to do with performance over time, and especially reliability or durability. So we started in 1941 with some simple tests compared to burning tests, just to show what happens if things would light. And if you think back to the genesis of UL itself, it was all because of the World's Fair in uh, Chicago when they started to introduce electricity and they started to have uh, different parts of uh, uh, e exhibitions actually starting fires. So the first thing we started to look at was fire as an issue. And so in the 64s, we, uh, 1964, we started to develop the burning, arcing, ignition, and tracking of plastics. And again, this is all kind of a prelude to the development of how um, processes that we could evaluate materials and look at how they can impact the safety of a device, an electrical device. In 67, we started talking specifically about insulation. And so in, in 1972, we published the first editions of A Path to Plastics. And so this was something that was put out to say, what, what can we do to evaluate materials and show that they're suitable for use in some end products? And so we did that. We're not like a government agency. We're not um, a trade association. We're not a professional society or a public health company. We're an independent organization that's very concerned about safety, very concerned about performance, very concerned about reliability and durability, and these standards all result from that perspective. So I'd like to take you through one of the polymer evaluations that we do to show you kind of some of the benefits and some of the limitations. And so um, when we go through this, I want to give you the basis, though, for why we even have it in the first place. Right now, there are 60 standards under development in the IEC Working Group, the International Working Group, for PV modules. I think there are 39 current projects underway to modify and adapt those standards. They're both performance-related and safety-related, and they're also on materials and on entire packages, everything from a wafer to a plant. But the primary ones for safety are 61730, and for, for per performance are 61215. A lot of the testing is closely linked. In the US, we use UL 1703, which is currently being harmonized with the IEC 61730. So next year, we'll be part of that global community in our evaluations. Also, there's currently editions of the performance standards in the US 61215 and 646. 
but it's all revolving now around that insulation coordination. And as we know, polymers are relied on very heavily for providing that insulation in, in PV modules especially. Somebody once told me that, you know, without the plastics in the PV module, we'd have all glass on glass with air gaps and some sort of sealing mechanism. They'd be unwieldy, expensive, heavy, and it's exactly the opposite of the goal that we have for, for uh, photovoltaics now. So if we look at the general requirements for insulation coordination in the, in the industries globally, we'd be looking at IEC 61664. Or, and then we'd also be looking at three different parts of that document. And in the US, the, the sister document, if you would, is UL 840. So that's where all the requirements are established. And we look at all sorts of different features of polymerics used as insulators in order to show their reliability. So we work at short-term type properties, uh, or I should say properties that can be easily assessed in the short term. We are concerned a lot about heat degradation of polymers. But as we look at this, we have to keep an eye open to the fact that some degradation mechanisms are changing as different Im implementations of polymers and systems are being used. But long-term th thermal degradation has been one of the major drivers, the critical paths towards degradation of polymers. So that's where we spent a lot of time. And that's resulted in our relative thermal index type testing. So this um, relative thermal indexing is what we'll spend a little bit of time on this morning. So we think about thermal performance of polymers in a package now, not necessarily on their own. We're really concerned about changes to the, uh, of characteristics over time that would result in the ability of that plastic to perform uh, over time. For example, thermal softening or creep, if you will, performance at temperature, right, and thermal endurance. And so we look at those short-term properties. We look at thermoplastics primarily in that area. We look at how that thermoplastic might distort under different um, forces when it's exposed to high temperatures. And of course, in PV modules, we have temperatures, normal operating temperatures, anywhere from 40 or 50 degrees C to under shaded conditions, sometimes up to 140, um, and then can avalanche after that. So how do those materials function under those conditions? So we look at uh, uh, things like heat defect, uh, deflection, vicat softening, ball pressure, mold stress relief, et cetera. And when we talk about creep, that's the, the movement of plastic over time when it's exerted, when some sort of mechanical force is exerted on that plastic, right? So we're looking for that, that degradation or that deformation that results from that, that exposure. Sometimes we call it cold flow. Um, the stresses can be anything from just the thermodynamic forces on a PV module to the way that the mounting systems are used or to the way they're installed and the forces exerted by the, the rack mounting system, for example. Um, thermosets, by the way, don't really experience creep in the same way, um, although it's also true that the interfaces between the materials can often be where the creep is the most uh, dramatic. A good example on a PV module would be the attachment of the junction box to the basket material. Um, RTI by itself, that relative thermal index, does nothing to address creep. So when we, oops, when we look at um, the profile of plastics, right, we can go from the solid to the viscoelastic solid to a liquid to the liquid. And so let's talk a little bit about a performance at temperature. And uh, it's an indicating, what we want to do is find out what happens when this temperature goes up. We all know that the characteristics can change, both from a physical standpoint and an electrical insulation standpoint. And then if we look at thermal endurance, we're trying to say how well can that material maintain the properties that it has now over time when it's stressed thermally. And it's not a predictive model. It's not saying that a material will last a given amount of time. It's not trying to assess the lifetime of an end product, for example. It's just merely a bar of entry, if you will, for the use of a material in an in a electrical product where it provides both physical and electrical um, um, benefits to the product. So we establish a number of different methods of doing this, and I'm going to cover a couple of those today. And from that, you'll see kind of a different picture of how we have to, as a, for example, UL as a third-party certifier, 
has to deal with different types of designs, different equipment, different materials, different combinations of materials, et cetera, and the limits that we are kind of under because the, the producer of the product has already gone through all, the, all their design. They've already done the, what I call the micro evaluations and testing on the individual materials, et cetera, but they may not have a picture of how that works together, how the combination of materials function, and they may not have an understanding of the long-term reaction of that. And what happens then is that even if they were to do all this testing, if they were to go to an AHJ, an AHJ or an authority having jurisdiction is gonna look at them and say, well, how do we verify that, that your statement or your claim is actually correct? So they look to third-party certifiers. The third-party certifiers then will take a look at the standards that are produced by the industry to do this testing. So the thermal endurance is one of the most relied upon tests for polymer materials. It's not a maximum operating temperature. It's simply a realistic service temperature at best. And so a temperature rating is, is defined here uh, for our discussion and for the relative thermal indexes, the temperature below which a critical property will not be unacceptably compromised through chemo, uh, chemical thermal degradation over the reasonable life of an electrical product. And again, here's another one of the gaps. What is a reasonable lifetime of an electrical product? As we heard in the last presentation, PV modules are regularly warranted at 25, year, uh, 25 years lifetime sometimes up to 40 years. And so is that different from your iPad or your cell phone? Absolutely, right? So how do we evaluate those materials and how can we take and correlate the values of a thermal index, for example, to real lifetime? And there's no solution to that yet, so that's one of the limitations we have. So when is an RTI required or a relative thermal index and which RTIs are required? I guess you could think about it as in the device where the polymeric is relied upon to comply with those standard requirements, um, then it would be necessary. So what happens if the material doesn't exist? Will the product still perform? Will it still be safe? Will it still avoid hazards from shock or, or fire, et cetera? And then what are the critical properties that we'd want to look at in order to determine if it's suitable? Well, we'd look at things like the dielectric wick strand strength of that particular material. Maybe it's the, um, the bulk resistance of the material. Perhaps it's something like it's, it's mechanical strength, such as crushing or ball impact, et cetera. And then we'll be looking primarily at those, you know, electrical strength and, and impact tests. And if the RTI, or that relative thermal index, is higher than the normalized hottest temperatures, or we call them sometimes worst case temperatures, during normal use, then we consider it to be suitable. But again, it's not a indicator of performance at elevated temperature at all. It's just showing that it maintains its characteristics. So a lot of materials will have generic RTIs based on a lot of field experience, and many will have that relative thermal index identified through testing. And so if we look at the testing, let's talk real quickly about the degradation mechanisms. We have the oxidation, whether it's chemical or thermal, the hydrolytic depolymerization, cross-linking, crazing, et cetera, with polymer materials. The oxidation is simply the recombination of elements in the polymer with environmental oxygen. Um, modules certainly have sealing mechanisms that help to avoid the ingress of oxygen, but how well do they do that? And how well will, well will they stay adhered, for example? If we look at aging theory, we can go back to the IEEE and we can talk about their general principles for temperature limits in electrical equipment and the evaluation of electrical insulation. And so if, as, as we show here, that the comparison of third, uh, thermal aging characteristics of one material can possibly be compared to another material if we have enough information. And where we're gonna go with that is exactly how we get to a relative thermal index versus a actual temperature index. So we follow the, the Arrhenius equation. Everybody's familiar with this, I'm sure. I won't spend extra time on this, but our goal is to, is to develop that plot and to look at the development or reaction of the material over time and compare that to the original performance of the material and look for some degradation, and we establish that bar of minimum, or I should say maximum degradation over a period of time. So there's a standard you might hear about once in a while, which is called 
UL 746B. That standard is a polymer standard. It's a long-term evaluation standard for, for materials, similar to the IEC 60216 document. Um, in the IC document, they have a correlation time between one polymer and another of 20,000 hours. In uh, the uh, 746B, it's 10,000 hours, but it can be reduced as low as 1,000 1, hours. And that comparison is, if we have a known material, and we'll get to this in a minute, and we have an unknown material, if we can show that they're really the same type of material, that we may be able to shorten the time if we can fit the curves of both materials. And so um, we'll look quickly at, at the material type. We'll look at what's important in the end product design that they want to use the material in, in order to determine those properties that we want to measure and look for that degradation. So we have two sets of ma material properties that we'll look at. We'll look at primary characteristics and we'll look at secondary. The primary properties are those that are most likely to be relied upon in the end product, and then also most likely to fail the quickest. And so these will be monitored continuously. In the secondary properties, those are the ones that we think will take longer to degrade, and so we, we consider them um, less important to monitor during the test. We'll just do testing following the exposures. And so those are things like flammability. Um, sometimes it can be electrical strength and uh, impact. So we use dog bone samples for all of our testing, uh, for the RTI testing. So these are standardized. Um, we use everything from the 746C type to the ISO 3167 type dog bone. So we're pretty specific in, in what we test. Here's an example of some of those. Um, we also look at the impact testing, as we mentioned before. We use ASTM standard test methods for that and, and ISO test methods. Um, the, there is a feeling in the industry that the ASTM TI is preferred. We do IZOT impact and Sharpie impact. And here's some of the samples that we use there. Um, dielectric strength, which we uh, rely very heavily on with polymers in end product designs. We'll work with ASTM 149 and IEC 60243 in order to evaluate uh, dielectric strength both as received and after exposures. And so we have different specimen thicknesses that we test. Again, all this is geared towards its anticipated end use and all that impacts and how we will actually conduct those tests. So when we look at things, we also look at the type of material that it is that will affect the sample size, that'll affect the configuration, and also affect thickness. As we can imagine, some very thin materials are harder to test, for example, with dielectrics and flashovers with the wrong sizes, et cetera. So we're very specific in that testing. So we talked a little bit about relative thermal index. So there's, there's a control that we use for that testing. And so what we're looking at is a relative measurement to another material. And so we'll be very careful on, on the selection of a control and the comparison. So in general, we use 746B as our test method. We, used, um, we use it because there's a lot of data going back many years on RTIs and a large material database so we can start to do these evaluations uh, quickly, quickly. We don't have to go to the full 10,000 hours, or in some cases, maybe up to 100,000 hours of actual multiple point measurements. We can do it by comparing to known materials. And so when we select and we look at that degradation mechanism of the materials, we look at the amount of data that we have on it, we do searches on you know, things like manufacturers, uh, on the base resins, uh, et cetera. And so what we do is we attempt to show that a particular material that we're evaluating for the first time has a fit or a curve fit with a 50% reduction in the properties of interest, those primary properties that we discussed before, and compare that to that known existing material in an attempt to, at different times, show that it has similar performance. And while it doesn't do a good job of looking for a knee in long-term performance, it does do a good job of showing where we can get to that 50% reduction in those critical properties.
So our aging is, is uh, for example, plotted ultimately into a graph very similar to this where we're showing the relative temperatures in the number of hours. This particular one is a reference for 170 degrees C relative thermal index. And those, then for the candidate reference, we'll be looking at that, comparing it to the known materials in order to come up with a correlation. And so that's how we end up with that 170 C degree temperature. Um, there are some differences globally in how this test is conducted. Again, we talked about a few of them earlier. The biggest one is the amount of correlation data that we have available and how we can fit those curves. And so with that, I will uh, end the discussion on the polymers. I could go on and on. 61730 is, is now changing. Our second edition is being published. And so all of the polymers uh, now have to go through a much more stringent, stringent evaluation in a PV module in, in order to prove their suitability and their reliability over time. So thank you very much.